Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at the detailed revision guide of the Migration, Identity and Sovereignty unit over here on my channel. It was a request of one of you guys who'd left a comment on one of my videos and so I thought I'd try and get this done as quickly as possible um, because I know your exams are coming up. So as I said this is the detailed one. I have done a few of these already on my channel. I've got the tectonics, the coastal and the superpowers ones up so far as I'm filming this. Um, there's also a glaciation one coming up, either it will be up or it's coming up, um, it's next week for me so just depends when I can get this up for you guys. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoy, I hope this is useful for you, um, yeah, and let's get straight into this. Causes of migration. There can be a variety of reasons for migrants to move, either internally or internationally. The cause of migration can affect how governments treat them or how the public perceive them. International migration can result as can result from a variety of causes. Voluntary economic migration, where people move to try and improve their wealth and quality of life. Often an economics family may follow them in the aim of joining their family. Uh, refugees, people forced to relocate due to war, conflict or persecution. Asylum seekers are people forced to flee for international protection. Environmental refugees, these are people specifically relocating due to a tectonic disaster, natural events such as wildfires or flooding, or the impact of climate change, such as desertification or sea level rise. And international students, within recent years there has been a large increase in the volume of young people migrating to study elsewhere. The flows of international migration will continue to change over time, as environmental, political and economic events occur and a country's development improves or declines. Rationale for encouraging migration. Migration is seen as, a, as an efficient way of ensuring the economic output of a country or place is optimised. Workers are integral to growing an economy. Migration is a way of growing a country or place's workforce. Internal migration, often from rural to urban areas, is mostly unrestricted, with some countries encouraging inter international migration within trade blocks and government agreements. For example, the EU has, a, has the largest free movement of migrants. Economic theory suggests that governments will maximise economic efficiency, a productive workforce and a developed financial market, if they allow the free movement of goods, capital and labour. However, some countries do not agree with the economic theory, for fear that they'll lose their national identity through unrestricted flows. Therefore, flows aren't fully unrestricted on a global scale. Rationale against encouraging migration. Some governments have more restricted immigration controls to restrict the number of immigrants coming into their country. It's important to recognise that a government's beliefs or rationale towards immigrants is due to their perception of immigrants. The consequences of migration may be viewed as positive and negative by different players. National culture. Migration usually leads to changes in the ethnic composition of areas. Some countries believe that the changes of their ethnic or cultural composition may lead to cultural diffusion, which could lead to the loss of their national culture or historical demographic. Employment. Some governments may encourage migrants to fill skills gaps or improve economic activity. However, especially in areas with high unemployment rates, locals may blame immigrants for the loss of job opportunities in the area. National security. Recent events, such as terror attacks on major cities and the so-called War on Terror, has caused political controversy regarding national security. Many people fear that freely allowing migrants to enter their country could pose a security risk. Views such as these have been exacerbated by some media outlets and politicians. The backlash against unregulated migration has led to changes within politics, such as the election of Donald Trump, and the rise of right and the rise of white right wing political parties and Brexit. The opportunity to migrate. The ability for an individual to migrate depends on government policies and border control and the physical environment. The migrants' education and skills. For example, migrants to Australia are restricted to many skilled individuals. They require sixty five points under a points based system which takes into account the demand for particular professions in Australia, in addition to a migrant's age, qualifications and competence in English. 
Singapore's migration policy is divided into foreign workers and foreign talent. Workers are predominantly unskilled migrants, mainly working in construction and domestic services. Talents are mainly people with degrees and are highly knowledgeable. The rise of smugglers in recent years means that migrants need money to migrate illegally across borders. Smugglers only operate across strict international borders, such as the Mexican-US border or the, Me or the Mediterranean Sea towards Europe. Nation states. A state is a territory that no other country has power or sovereignty over. As of 2016, the UN recognised 196 states, with South Sudan being the most recent addition. A nation refers to a group of people who lack sovereignty. This includes the Welsh and Scottish nations, as they are part of the sovereign state of the UK. These nations lack full control, despite having their own parliaments and language. Nation states don't necessarily have a single culture or language, and the borders, both physical and political, between states are often contested. Cultural unity. There can be different languages, sports teams, dialects, music and literature within a single state. This can be the result of historical migration, such as in the USA, where the descendants of European settlers have vastly outnumbered the descendants of indigenous tribes. Alternatively, some states have a single ethnic group, ethnicity and cultural identity due to its physical location, such as Iceland, or political forced isolation, such as North Korea, in which the government restricts interactions with foreign countries. Establishing national borders. Borders between states are highly important in establishing governance for a region and to avoid conflict. However, there are still tensions and contests over borders and islands to this day. National borders may be created naturally or through social intervention. Natural borders. These are physical features such as lakes, mountains or rivers that can separate countries. Often, natural borders are the most successful borders between states because of their inarguable division. This may be because armies cannot cross these natural borders unnoticed, or that these natural borders create a band of uninhabitable land, easily separating two states without conflict over resident sovereignty. Colonial or political intervention. Borders are drafted by the sovereign state and may have been influenced by past empire and expansion. Borders created by governments may not take into account the differences between religious or ethnic groups, which could lead to conflict between social groups in the future. Such as was the case for, Ru for Rwanda, where clashing ethnic groups within one state spiralled into the genocide of 800,000 Tutis. Contested border examples. Ukraine and Crimea. The population of Crimea consists of 58% ethnic Russians, 24% ethnic Ukrainians and 12% Tartar Muslims. In 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, added Russian added Crimea to the Russian state from Ukraine on the basis that the majority of the population was ethnically Russian and the Ukraine government wasn't successfully protecting them. The international community condemned Russia's annexation and, it, and imposed sanctions against Russian trade, but they haven't made much, process, much progress in settling the dispute and resolving the conflict within Crimea. Taiwan. Since 1950, Taiwan has been independent. However, China still claims sovereignty over it and regards Taiwan as a, rebel, as a rebel province. China insists no other countries should have any relations with Taiwan, but that has not stopped Taiwan from becoming one of Asia's most economically successful places through the production of computer technology. Syria and Iraq. Conflict in this region may be due to the Sykes pickup line, a border between French occupation and the UK's control in the Middle East. Large Kurdish, Shia and Sunni populations were divided across this line and extremist groups such as Daesh and Al-Qaeda have incited conflict between the social groups. The UN Security Council, primarily the US and Russia, is involved, conducting airstrikes against the extremist groups perceived as terrorists. 19th century nationalism and colonialism between 1500 and 1900, many European powers had built global empires. Newly discovered South Africa was invaded and colonised by the Spanish, while the UK, France and Belgium colonised parts of Asia and Africa. For example, by 1880, Britain controlled a third of the world's land surface and over a quarter of the world's population. British culture spread across South Africa, sports, language and customs, through local governments and 
through local governance and education, controlled by the UK. As a result, many previously colonial states now have the Union Jack within their own flag. However, the, the empires disintegrated during the First World War. Because the high cost of the war left the UK almost bankrupt, there was growing resistance to foreign rule and the rise of independence, independent political groups. Rapid population growth was becoming a major problem for the UK government, and European countries were becoming less dependent on raw materials from their colonies. Some independent states, such as Vietnam and Sudan, were left unable to successfully govern themselves. This has led to many conflicts and wars following the end of the imperial era. The conflict has been costly to their development, natural environment and in terms of human fatalities. Post-colonial migration. In 1948, the British, National Act, the British Nationality Act gave all Commonwealth citizens an equal right to legally settle in the UK. As a result, many employers filled skill gaps with Commonwealth migrants, such as the London Underground and the NHS. Both skilled and unskilled migrants were accepted. For example, skilled migrants worked as healthcare professionals, whilst less skilled workers worked in the manufacturing industries, especially in the textile towns of Lancashire and Yorkshire. There was cultural clustering, with Commonwealth families moving to the same area to share opportunities, create networks of families to support and to limit their isolation. This clustering can still be seen today, with the growth of some Commonwealth communities becoming important parts of major cities. Globalisation's effect on migration and sovereignty. The economic impacts of globalisation. Many TNCs have relocated their headquarters to countries such as Ireland, Switzerland and Luxembourg due to low corporate tax rates. In 2015, the UK's corporate tax rate was around 20%, but it was around 10% in Switzerland. TNCs also consider the support from the local government, including financial bail, infrastructure construction and economic incentives to relocate there. Some states have become notorious tax havens, locations which offer ma massive tax advantages to individuals and companies. These states tend to be politically stable and have secure banking and legal systems. In 2015, it was reported that American companies held two trillion dollars overseas in tax havens. Tax havens also become home for the wealthy, who would rather migrate than face extortionate millionaire taxes. Tax havens have, a large, have large economic consequences for the other states. All taxes paid by businesses are crucial for governments to fund healthcare, education and other public services. As a result, there are significant impacts if countries use transfer pricing or tax havens which could stunt a state's development and attractiveness to migrants. Many companies have been targeted by citizen-led protests, such as Starbucks and Google, which has led to voluntary tax contributions by TNCs to try and recover their public confidence. However, some companies do not relocate to reduce their tax rates. A TNC may want to maintain a certain public perception regarding the product's manufacturing. Instead of relocating, many TNCs choose to use transfer pricing when profits are diverted through subsidiary, con through subsidiary companies based in, low tax country based in low tax countries, which in turn reduces the corporate tax bill for a company. Many industrialised countries have adopted the Washington Consensus, the belief that economic efficiency can only be achieved by removing financial regulations. In the 1970s and 80s, deregulation became very common, as state intervention of the markets reduced. As a result of deregulation, capital could flow anywhere in the world easily and quickly, which has helped to accelerate globalisation. However, financial deregulation contributed heavily to the 2008 financial crisis. Alternative economic models Leaders, many from South African countries, have moved from open market economies to a socialist approach. The reason is to argue against capitalism, include in 2016, 62 of the richest people own the same wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion. The global financial crisis in 2008 and the growing inability of Western countries to reduce inequality shows the limitations of deregulated open markets. Ongoing failure of countries to reduce their climate change impacts rather than accumulate wealth. To adopt a more sustainable economic system, governments, such as Bolivia or Ecuador, must limit imports of essential resources, such as food, water and raw materials, 
ensure energy security, often using renewable sources, reduce TNCs, instead promoting local businesses to ensure employment opportunities and tax is generated. Intergovernment organisations in the post-1945 world. IGOs have grown in significance and influence since World War II. They can provide political guidance and judgment over a state government or economic support for developing countries. The United Nations. In 1944, the UN aims, structure and roles were agreed by the USA, UK, USSR and China, who form the permanent members of the Security Council alongside with France. Its aims include maintaining international peace and security, promoting sustainable development, protecting human rights, upholding international law and delivering humanitarian aid. However, the UN is not unbiased, since national disputes often influence UN policy making. The Syrian conflict was an example of such unbiased judgement. Russia and China wanted to, to an extent, to support the Assad regime, regime, whereas the USA, UK and France support the rebels. All decisions regarding the Syrian conflict were based from the state's opinions, which could arguably have been what caused the conflict to escalate. The Security Council, arguably the most important part of the UN, meets to respond to threats to national security and international security. The UN can introduce economic sanctions against countries or can carry out direct military intervention. Arms embargoes, banning weapons and military supplies, trade embargoes such as banning imports and exports to certain countries, restrictions on loans, freezing assets and travel restrictions for high profile people like politicians and business people. The success of UN intervention is mixed. States can act cooperatively and can share resources and information to reduce loss of life. However, the UN has no hard power methods to police countries. Countries can ignore advice from the UN. For example, Russia ignores the UN's advice in relation to its ongoing conflict with the Ukraine. The World Bank and IMF. The World Bank and International Monetary Fund have headquarters in Washington, USA. They were established to try and stabilise global finance markets after a Great Depression and post-World War II, which caused many countries to become nearly bankrupt. Many Western countries agreed to the policies of the World Bank and the IMF, including a fixed exchange rate for any loans or financial assistance, based on the US dollar and gold. The USA had a disproportionate influence on Bretton Woods, a conference in 1944, over how the world economic system was to be designed. This was because only the USA was left with a large amount of financial resources after the wars, whilst the UK and other European states were left almost bankrupt. As these institutions were created and are regulated by Western countries, they can often favour developed countries over developing countries in terms of the help that they offer. They are, the IMF and World Bank agreed to only help struggling countries if they agreed to the Structural Adjustment Policies, SAPS, SAPS. SAPS are often policies which countries have to implement if they want to receive a loan. They are designed to help them open up the developing countries to trade and production to grow their economy to help them develop. SAPs can include opening up domestic markets to allow for private investment, reducing the role of government by privatising industries and services, removing restrictions on capital so there are no limits on, on international investment, reducing government spending by cutting infrastructure and welfare spending, and devaluing the currency to make exports cheaper. Critics argue that the loans are reliant on countries implementing these policies and their governments are forced into them. These policies are not always beneficial to the country that implements them. In the 1980s, global interest rates increased very rapidly. This caused substantial interest to be added to the loans which increased global debt. Developing countries were mainly affected since the loan was unaffordable and quickly accumulated. Countries were struggling to pay off the interest of the loan of these loans and were ending up in further debt, which was not beneficial to their economy. In 2005, 30 billion pounds of debt of the 18 poorest countries in the world were written off thanks to a deal broker by the G7 countries. The highly indebted poor countries initiative. In 1996, the IMF and World Bank introduced the HIPC initiative. Following criticism over spiralling debt of developing countries and lack of fair assistance from the IMF and World Bank, HIPC aimed at reducing the national debt of developing countries by writing them off in return for structural adjustment policies. The, I 
The HIPC initiative affected 35 of the world's least developed countries with the greatest debt. By 2000, many NGOs such as Oxfam began demanding more action to reduce the debt and burden of most indebted countries. In 2008, all debts owed to the World Bank and IMF by 18 HIPC were cancelled on the condition that each country showed financial management a lack of corruption and national governments spent any savings on poverty reduction, education and healthcare. The World Trade Organisation Members of financial IGOs is almost universal, with WTO members accounting for 96.4% of world trade and 96.7% of global GDP. The WTO was established to create a fair, free and global trading. There are now several single markets where there is free movement of goods, services and people between allied nations. However, a global single market is still unachievable. Due to the failure of the WTO, many trade blocs between nations have emerged. Often they are more influential than the WTO. Businesses can benefit from economies of scale when operating within trade blocs because they have because they have access to larger markets, therefore they can scale up production, manufacturing bulk quantities, which in turn helps them to reduce their unit cost and earn more profit. Decisions to join trade blocks should be taken cautiously by governments, however, as local markets could become flooded by cheap products from another country within the block, which may damage local, local businesses and the country's economy. All countries within a trade block may not have equal beneficiaries, with some countries taking political or economic leadership of the block. IGO's actions and the environment. Within the last few decades, IGOs have initiated many environmental agreements and protocols between governments. This may be to protect endangered species or landscapes, reduce greenhouse emissions or sovereignty overseas surrounding the state. Climate change was first raised as an Climate change was first raised as an important issue in 1992 at the UN East Summit Conference. There has been uncertainty over evidence and disagreements between countries who should be held responsible for emissions. This has meant that international cooperation on climate change has been very slow. Many pledges have been created, each successively receiving more member signatures and having stricter targets set. However, Critics still say that IGOs don't go far enough and don't have strict enough consequences for nations who don't follow them. Alternatively, the UN Convention of, on the Law of the Sea has been more successful than climate change agreements in resolving governmental disputes over sea rights. 157 countries have signed an agreement which declares ownership of state seas 20 nautical miles from their land, gives landlocked countries entitlement to seas near them, enabling them to trade, and aims to prevent and aims to protect marine diversity and ocean environments. Despite clarifying most sea disputes, UCLOS has led to increased tensions over disputes of Newfoundland islands, which lay claim to untapped natural resources and military expansion opportunities, such as the case as many islands in the South China Sea, which China, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea all argue over, and some Arctic islands, causing conflict between the USA, Denmark, Canada and Russia due to its proximity to the Arctic. Finally, IGOs become peacekeepers between nations over transboundary water conflicts and the Antarctic. With rapid population growth and the rising demand for water, conflict between nations who owns a river and how to best manage it will escalate. The Antarctic, currently protected for science, is protected by many IGOs and NGOs who wish to preserve it against modern pollution and rubbish, especially with the tide of plastic waste and and to protect endangered species from humans as well as climate change. The idea of nationalism can be seen as a powerful force, with many governments intent to maintain a sense of nationalism through education, such as the curriculum of areas of history and citizenship are important as they play a cultural and political role in nation state building, whilst introducing a government's ideology from a young age. Students may learn about legal and human rights as well as their responsibilities to their country. Sport and culture. You are likely to support a nation's sports team and international competitions such as the Olympics and Paralympics. People dress up and, fa and paint their faces, which suggests national identity, and political parties. Governments have used policies to reinforce national values and ideals for many years. A member's agenda can be strongly associated with a country's identity to gain more and more mem members and votes. 
Examples of nationalism include national flags, um, singing of a national anthem, promoting British values, which has been the case since 2014 in English schools, which are democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance for those of different faiths, backgrounds, and ethnicities. In 2015, there were widespread protests in South Korea and China because Japan approved new textbooks which would promote nationalist ideas of Japan and described World War II conflict from the Japanese point of view. In many European countries, there has also been a rise in extremist right-wing parties. In the UK, membership of UKIP has grown rapidly since 1981 has grown rapidly since 1991, as people want to restrict UK borders and adopt anti-immigration policies. Particular environments can also be identified with the state. Rural life and the English countryside have become symbolic of English identity and lifestyle. Identity can often be associated with citizenship and an individual's right to live within a state. Many US citizens find common focus for identity and rights and the freedom they have according to the US Constitution. The First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech and the second guarantees the right to self-defence, which includes the right to own firearms. The UK's Magna Carta is viewed as the foundation of British laws, liberties and principles. Japan, for example, uses little inward migration because it wants to protect its culture and the homogeneity. Challenges to national identity. Ownership of foreign businesses and land. In many countries, there have been many inward flows of investment and ideas through globalisation. Many assets in the UK are now foreign owned, such as American TNC Craft bought by Cadbury in 2010. The UK's car industry is also completely foreignly owned. Foreign governments have also bought assets here, um, such as the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund, who own Harrods. And the Chinese government bought a stake, a major stake in Heathrow Airport and many nuclear plants, including Hinkley Point, which could potentially threaten the UK's energy security. Businesses provide jobs for people, so their companies may not be concerning employees. However, foreign-owned companies don't need to pay taxes here, so the UK government loses out. Growing foreign ownership of properties and land in the UK may also be seen as a major threat to national identity. London property can be seen as extremely lucrative, mainly due to the demand of, mainly due to the demand of international wealthy migrants. In 1980, 8% of the city of London was owned by migrants. This value rose to 50% in 2011. Foreign ownership of land has caused a lot of anger among locals due to a lack of housing, especially affordable, and a surge of prices has made buying a first home very difficult. On the other hand, many UK citizens are responsible for changing places of identities in coastal areas of France, Spain and Italy. There has been outward migration of British retirees and entrepreneurs abroad, replacing the cultural landscape of many tourist areas as a result. Some TNCs have altered their way of life in many countries they have invested in. They can offer different employment opportunities, new products and lifestyle changes. Disunity within nations. There has been increasing numbers of interdependent parties and demonstrations for nationalism within recent years. Most prominent examples of, disun most prominent examples of disunity would be Catalonia, currently experiencing intense protests and Scotland, following the UK's decision to leave the EU. Catalonia is located in northern eastern Spain. Its capital is Barcelona. The Catalan people have their own language and customs and is the wealthiest region in Spain, producing 20% of Spain's wealth. Many Catalonians want independence from Spain. In 2017, the Catalonian government held a referendum in which more than 90% of voters wanted independence. However, the vote was seen as illegal by the Spanish government and thus wasn't complete, completely trusted officially. Scotland. In 2014, a referendum was held in which 45% of voters voted for independence, whilst 55% voted against independence from the UK. This has caused great division within the population, especially regarding politics. Scotland's international income, Scotland's income predominantly comes from oil and gas in the North Sea. But as oil prices are very low, independence may have been very costly, as the Scottish wouldn't have had reliable sources of government revenue. Support for another referendum is rising after Brexit, however. Tensions in emerging nations. Globalisation has many winners and losers. 
Emerging nations have great inequality between the wealthy elite and the extremely poor. Nationalism has increased in countries where globalisation has created tensions. Brazil. Brazil's hosting of the World Cup in 2014 and the Olympics exposed serious divisions of Brazil's society. More than $22 billion was spent on preparing for the World Cup. Protests took place as people believe the money spent on the World Cup could be spent solving some of Brazil's biggest problems, such as poor public services, high food prices and widespread corruption among politicians. Russia. Russia is the world's largest country and is home to many ethnic groups, some residing far from Moscow. Nomadic herders are also found in Russia, wandering the northern altitudes. There is rising tension of the government's protection of ethnic groups with and without, within and outside Russia's borders. India. There have been many rising tensions between Muslims and Hindus since Indian, India gained independence. Many Muslims in Kashmir support breaking away from India as a separate state or joining Pakistan. Furthermore, more than 500 million Indian people live in extreme poverty and lack, and lack access to healthcare and education, mostly living in rural areas, and so there is resentment from the inequality in the benefits of and the benefits from globalisation. China. China's Haku system means that many rural migrants cannot benefit from globalisation by working in factories supporting TNCs. There are more than 300 million rural migrants, many of whom suffer from poverty, famine and illness from living close to polluting factories. Failed states. In failed states there are vast differences between wealthy and political elites, foreign investment groups and the general population. A failed state is where the political and economic systems are very weak and the government can no longer maintain control and order. The following are usually common in failed states. Low life expectancy, social unrest, poor education, poor healthcare system, widespread poverty and high inequality levels. Often, failed states can be created from war and conflict, which damages any remaining infrastructure and services, resulting in dire living conditions and drastic outward migration. And that is the end of the detailed revision unit of of the Migration, Identity and Sovereignty unit over here on my channel. I hope this was useful. Um, yeah, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe down below so that you don't miss any of the other content I put out in the next few weeks. Good luck with your exams and I will see you soon. Bye guys.